Hello and welcome to Catholic Answers Live. I'm Cy Kellett, your host, and we've got two hours of open forum uh, for you today. So if you have a question about the Catholic faith, you want to know about Jesus, you want to know about the sacraments, you want to talk about the moral life, 888-318-7884. Uh, or uh, this first hour, we've got Jimmy Aiken with us. So you can, uh, the other category is everything else. 888 888- 318-7884. Jimmy Aiken, I got a stack of books here uh, by Jimmy. Daily Defense, 365 Days Plus One to Becoming a Better Apologist. The Fathers Know Best. The Bible is a Catholic Book. And uh, the author. And that, that's just the beginning. Uh, senior apologist here at Catholic Answers. Also the proprietor of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Hello, Jimmy Aiken. Very hello, Cy Kellett. How are you today? Well, very hello to you as well. Uh, is your universal translator off? <laughs> oh no, no, no! I'm just, I'm just borrowing a borrowing a little usage from Japanese. Uh, well, we're awful glad you're here um, on Thursdays. I think the, the the probably the excitement starts to build all around the globe because the next day there's mm-hmm. going to be a Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. So what can the globe yeah. expect tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Jesus's wife. This was a document that made the news a few years ago, and it's a very small document. It's like less than the size of a credit card, but it purports to be an early Christian gospel, not from the first century, but from the first few centuries, that seems to refer to Jesus having a wife. And... Um, and we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the scholar Karen King who promoted this. Uh, we're going to look at the mystery of where did the document come from, and we're going to look at what scholars concluded about it, and we're going to tell you exactly who forged it. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Yes, I, I, this is a good mystery. Oh, I'm glad you're uh, going to do this one. Uh, very, very interesting. All right. The, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it didn't it even seem unusual at the beginning when it was a tiny little document that said the exact words that would... Uh, well, I'm not going to today. I'm not going to give away what's <laughs> what gave it away. Okay. But uh, but there is a mystery here and we're going to trace it back to its origins. All right. Uh, check it out tomorrow on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. There's hundreds of episodes there and uh, thousands and thousands of people have enjoyed them. You can, too. Just go to mysterious.fm or search Jimmy Aiken or Mysterious World and you'll find it. You'll get there and uh, you'll be happy when you did. 888 888- Three one eight seven eight eight four is I the number love here. That time travel verb conjugation. There, you'll be happy when you did. <laughs> I know that. Instead right. of you'll be happy when you do. <laughs> it's raining here, Jimmy, and I get a little foggy uh-huh. when, when, <laughs> when oh, it's raining. Okay. I'm very weather dependent. Most people get rainy when it yeah. rains, but if you get foggy, that's okay, that's yeah. up to you. Yeah. Different <laughs> different weather for different folks. That's exactly right. Yes, uh, John's in Texas watching on YouTube, and John. Uh, is enthusiastic, called before the show even started. Well, we're happy you're here, John. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hey, Mr. Aiken. Uh, my question today is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 30-34. How would mm-hmm. you respond to the claim that this is a false promise made by Jesus? Okay, so we need to start uh, with the text. You said Matthew 6, verses 30-34. to 34. Is it, Was that it? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says uh, in verse 30, he's he's talking about how we need to put our focus on God, and he draws a comparison to um, the lilies of the field, which he notes neither toil nor spin, meaning they don't spin cloth. When I was a kid, I always imagined rotating lilies, but he doesn't mean the lilies don't rotate, he means they don't they don't spin cloth, you know, to clothe themselves. Oh, and he yeah. says, he says, not e- yet, not even Solomon in all his glory was clothed like these, meaning they're really pretty flowers. Then starting in verse 30, he says, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not, because they used it for fuel, uh, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. So this is a basic anti-anxiety message. Uh, Jesus is saying you need to 
keep your focus on God. And keep if you keep your focus on God, God will help you out. Um, this is not a an unconditional promise. Uh, we always have to read promises in terms of uh, the mind of the one giving them. That's true when we have promises you know, between uh, just or us as ordinary human beings. And it's true when we read promises in Scripture, too. So, for example, if I promised, let's say I was still living in San Diego, and I promised, hey, Cy Kellett, I'll bring over a pizza at the end of the show. You yes. know, that would be a promise. But if on the way to get the pizza, my car breaks down, and there's an earthquake, and people are injured, and they urgently need my assistance in order to help keep them alive until medical services can arrive, then Cy Kellett is going to understand that the promise I gave is, is suspended, at least for the moment. He's not going to say, you broke your promise, you know, and didn't bring over a pizza at the end of the show. It, you know, he's going to understand there was an, that my car broke down, there was an earthquake, there were people injured, they needed urgent medical attention, and that overrode the promise in question. Even though I had never said, I'll bring over a pizza at the end of the show unless my car breaks down and there's an earthquake and people are injured who need emergency medical attention. You know, I don't have to say those things. It is common understanding that there are things that can trump a given promise being fulfilled, and we don't fault each other for that. We recognize that there are unstated, reasonable conditions. And so, like, for example, with this promise uh, that Jesus is giving, he's, he's not saying, oh, yeah, just care about God, and God will cause food to magically appear on your table and clothing to magically appear in your closet. Um, he's assuming, and this is an unstated condition, but he's assuming that you're going to go out and do work, that you're going to go out and do work to get food and get clothes and things like that. What he's saying is God will help you out. If you keep your focus on God, then God will help you out as you do your work. Does that mean God will help you out no matter what? There are no exceptions to this? Well, no. Uh, we, As we read elsewhere in Scripture, there can be and are, in fact, problems in this life. And so we have to read uh, promises like this in light of what else we know from Scripture. And one of the things we know from Scripture, as St. Paul says, is that uh, the righteous man enters heaven through many trials, and so you got to expect trials in this life. In fact, uh, St. Paul himself, you know, ended up being martyred, but it would be ridiculous for St. Paul at, you know, just after his martyrdom, as soon as he gets to heaven, to say, hey, God, I, uh, I, I kept my focus on you, and, and I got martyred, so you didn't provide food for me for the day after I was martyred, and you didn't provide clothes for me for the day after I was martyred. You know, you're, you've broken your promise. Well, no, because God didn't promise him he wouldn't be martyred. In fact, Jesus himself warned us Christians may be martyred. So there can be situations in life where um, things are not going to go the way we want. And there may be times like, for example, times of famine or times of oppression where, you know, people don't have economic opportunity to be able to make a living. Or, um, you know, times of persecution, where people are thrown in prison and, you know, can't get good food and can't get good clothes and may even be martyred. So we have to read the promise here at the end of Matthew 6, at the end of Matthew 6, in light of everything else we know from Scripture, because you can't repeat every single condition that could possibly apply to a promise when you make it. If we did that, we would we would never make promises because we would never be able to do anything. We'd just be listing endless conditions of things that could theoretically supersede a given promise we're making. So we have to read this one just like we read other human promises in terms of what's reasonable, what can we reasonably expect from God. And what Jesus is assuring us here is if we keep our focus on God, 
you know, so we have our priorities right, then God will help us out as we strive to make a living and be able to buy food and get clothes and things like that. And he'll help us out and it'll all be okay. What we shouldn't do is get excessively worried about where is our food going to come from and where is our clothes going to come from and things like that. He's saying, just chill. Keep your focus on God. Do your part. You know, go make a living and God will help you out. So you don't really need to get excessively anxious about all this. You can relax. Doesn't mean there's never going to be problems in life. There may and will be at times problems all the way up to martyrdom. He warned us about that. But in the main, when you're not in one of those situations, you can relax, trust God, and just do your part. John, thank you for getting us started. Appreciate the question. we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Open Forum with Jimmy Aiken right after this on Catholic Answers Live. We're here for you. Call now. Catholic Answers Live. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro-life organizations. On the web at realestateforlife.org. EWTN Global Catholic Network is the largest religious media network in the world. 11 global TV channels, English and Spanish radio networks with over 500 AM and FM radio affiliates, one of the largest Catholic websites in the world, dozens of podcasts every week, social media, electronic and print news services, and EWTN publishing. EWTN is the global Catholic network. For more about EWTN, visit EWTN.com. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Uh, second hour, Mark Brumley will be here, president of Ignatius Press. And this hour, Jimmy Aiken is with us. So a perfect day to call and get your questions in. If you've got a question for Jimmy, give us a call, 888-318-7884. Alan's in Jacksonville, Florida, watching on YouTube. Alan, we're glad you're here. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hello, Mr. Jimmy Aiken. You are my favorite cyborg time lord with a glorious beard. Just want to say <laughs> I love you. Oh, wow. Kendall, just because of your book. <laughs> well, you're um, most kind. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, my question. Mm -hmm. I'm a military pilot, and okay. I just found out that I'm going to be invested as a knight in the Order of the Holy Sepulchre. Okay. The Order's charism is, as you know, the protection of Christians and Christian sites in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. With the war in Israel going on, there is a possibility that it could be ordered to take action that could lead to the death of Christians or destruction of holy sites, the mm. antithesis of the Order's charism. Mm -hmm. How do I reconcile with that? Um, would I need spiritual direction, become a conscientious objector? Well, I can imagine there being circumstances in which one would need to object on conscientious grounds. You know, like if they said, bomb the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, I would say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bomb another military target that has a legitimate military value, but I'm not bombing the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That's not a military installation. It has no military value. It's not an enemy base, and so I'm not bombing it. Um, but I think it's very unlikely that you're, that it's at all probable for you to be ordered to bomb a holy site. What I can imagine instead is, uh, you being ordered to, uh, bomb something that's near a holy site and the holy site might suffer some collateral damage, but collateral damage can be justified, even if it's a holy site, it can be justified if the military target is of sufficient value. Uh, the same thing applies to, um, to undertaking action that could lead to the deaths of Christians. Just because you're a member or about to be a member of the Order of the Holy Sepulchre and, and their charism is helping protect Christians in the Holy Land, that doesn't mean that, that Christians can never die in the Holy Land. Um, in fact, you know, given its its history, the members of the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, in order to protect Christians in the Holy Land, have at times had to engage in actions that might result in the death, uh, accidentally, not on purpose, 
of a Christian in the Holy Land, or they they may have had to uh, actually uh, actually use lethal force against a Christian in the Holy Land who was, for example, endangering other Christians in the Holy Land, and that's legitimate. That's consistent with the. Uh, with the purpose of the Order of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, you can, uh, def- in order to defend innocence, you can use lethal force against aggressors, even though if those aggressors are, are otherwise Christians. And the, similar, the same principles apply when it comes to collateral damage. If in order to uh, take out a target that is of sufficient military value, there is a risk of collateral damage, and you know, that can be justified, even if the, the collateral damage might involve the unintentional um, death of, of Christians who wouldn't, one would otherwise want to protect. So I'm not seeing anything here that would, in principle, prevent you from being able to fulfill an ordinary military mission that you're given. If you're given something that is unlawful, then, you know, per the Uniform Code of Military Justice, my understanding is you have to refuse the order. And similarly, if um, you were given an order that was intrinsically immoral, like, you know, attack a civilian target directly with the intent to kill civilians, as opposed to take out a military target, um, where some civilians might die as collateral damage, then you'd have to refuse that on conscientious grounds. But uh, unless U.S. military policy is very different than what I'm aware of, um, I don't think you're likely to be given such an order. But you would need to refuse it if you were, you know, given an order that was intrinsically immoral. Alan? Sure. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that was really helpful. It's just uh, it can get really tough when um the enemy doesn't exactly uh, wear a uniform and yep. often blends in with the military with the uh, with civilian populace. So, yep. I really yep. appreciate your help. Yeah, I, I I acknowledge the difficulty and and the it is immoral to hide among civilians in that way because it puts innocent people at risk. And that's why, you know, under the Geneva Conventions and so forth, um, you know, uniform combat is required so that you can tell who the legitimate combatants are and distinguish them from civilians. And this kind of uh, hiding among civilians is cowardly and immoral, but the moral responsibility is on the people who are doing the hiding among civilians. It's not on the people who have to take out the aggressors, even though they're hiding among civilians. Alan, uh, thank you for the call. I do hope that that was helpful to you. Uh, and uh, call again if, you, if you'd like some follow-up. Uh, Stephen is in Matthews, Virginia, watching on YouTube. Stephen, thank you for waiting. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, uh, would it be considered a uh, grave matter to uh, privately, like with a friend or even publicly, like on the Internet or something, to uh, express disagreement uh, on a non-definitive teaching, like um, like specifically with the death penalty, to basically say that I disagree with Pope Francis, I think it should be admissible, even with our modern uh, prison technology, I, I don't think it goes against uh, human dignity. To say that, would, th- would that be, like, uh, would that be something serious that I shouldn't do? Well, okay, so there's there are different questions there you just asked. The first one you asked was, is it grave matter? Um, and the answer, and you asked the question both in generic terms about disagreeing, including publicly, with a non-infallible teaching, and, and you also asked privately, and then you specifically asked about the death penalty. So let's do our best to kind of take those one at a time and we'll see how far we can get before we hit the break. Um, It, 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 with regard to disagreement with a non-infallible teaching, what one is required to do in terms of offering uh, religious submission of intellect and will to such a teaching, um, one is required to give the church, the the magisterium, the benefit of a doubt. Um, So if there's a doubt, 
you need to say, well, even though I don't understand this or I don't see the basis for it, I'm, I, I trust the church because I know the church is guided by the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to I'm going to accept this, even though I personally d don't feel confident in it. However, if you think there are very compelling reasons, not just personal opinion, but very compelling reasons why a non infallible teaching is uh, is actually an error then one can disagree with it. Uh, this is acknowledged, it's not automatically sinful, but it, you, before you get to that point, you want to do your best to work through the teaching and the basis for it and objections to it, uh, giving the Church the benefit of the doubt. I have a whole uh, chapter in my book, Teaching with Authority, which, uh, Sai, maybe we can send sure. Stefan, um, where I talk about how to how to deal with difficulties with church teaching. But the church recognizes that it can be you can, in good conscience, disagree with some non infallible teachings on an exceptional basis. You can't say things legitimately like the church is habitually mistaken in its prudential judgments, but there can, and the Church has acknowledged this, there can be situations where a non-infallible teaching is not a perfect teaching, and one can legitimately disagree in that case. So what can you do next? Once you've arrived, God forbid, that you need to disagree with a non-infallible teaching. Well, you can certainly hold that opinion privately, and you could you could talk to other people about it privately. Um, what the church does not want to see happen is public opposition to uh, to the church's teaching. That's called dissent. Now, here in America, we often use the term dissent to just mean disagree, but that's not how the church uses the term. the The magisterium uses the term dissent very specifically to refer to public opposition. And they're even pretty generous on when it what come when it, when it comes to public opposition. For example, if you wrote an article for a scholarly journal, and you know said to other scholars, "I've got a problem with this teaching. Here's what I'm thinking. What do y'all think?" That does not count as public opposition because you're just circulating it to a community of scholars. What you're not doing is holding a press conference and going on CNN or Fox or something like that and making a big public show of, I oppose this teaching. Um, when it comes to what you say on, on, on social media, well, one always wants to be respectful, but if you were to, if you're, unless you're a major social media influencer, you know, if you're just an ordinary person, you got a few friends, um, and you happen to say, you know, respectfully, I, I think this teaching is mistaken, then you're not, uh, I would say that that wouldn't count as public opposition because it's essentially a private discussion among a group of friends. It just happens to be on social media, but really very few people are going to see it, and most of the people who will see it are personal friends of yours. So I would view that as really kind of a private communication. But if you're a social media influencer with a big audience, it, it would be public uh, opposition to, to go on uh, social media. Like I've got, you know, uh, multiple thousands of people that follow my social media accounts. It would be public opposition for me to do that. Um, and so just to put myself on the spot, so you, one is not supposed to publicly oppose the teaching of the magisterium, even on non-infallible issues. Uh, would it then be, be, uh, a serious matter? Well, um, it, it's going to depend on the circumstances, but it's a potentially serious matter and potentially even a grave matter to publicly dissent from a non-infallible teaching. An example of that would be what uh, the moral theologian Charles Koran did after the publication of uh, Humanae Vitae in 1968, when Paul VI released the encyclical Humanae Vitae on, among other things, contraception. Um, the, the Vatican spokesman, who they picked, to introduce this said, this is a serious teaching, but it's not infallible. So the way the Vatican positioned this, hmm. this was a serious but non-infallible teaching. And then Charles Koran, an American moral theologian, 
starts holding press conferences and going on TV and giving interviews to the New York Times and things like that, mount leading an opposition to that. And I would say that's grave matter, you know, to to do something like that. But it's going to depend on the scale. It's like lying. You know, most lies are not grave matter, but they can be grave matter. And I would say the same, it come, it's the same thing if one is, um, you know, publicly saying, well, I don't really agree with this teaching. In many circumstances, that's not going to be grave matter, but in some it will be. When it comes to the death penalty in particular, um, there are it, there are aspects of that that have to be very carefully teased apart. Uh, some of the aspects of this teaching are indeed moral, but others seem to be sociological. And the sociological premises that are involved in the teaching are not properly speaking doctrinal and don't require the same adherence that the moral principles do. So that's a concise summary, but I'm afraid we've hit the break. I hope that's helpful. And do hang on. We'll send you that book, Teaching with Authority, if you can give us an address. It's open forum. Jimmy Aiken is our guest. Right back with more right after this on Catholic Answers Live. Why We're Catholic is the one book you can hand to anyone to invite them into or back to the Catholic faith. With more than 400,000 copies sold, Trent Horn's book has had a number one ranking on Amazon.com for five years running. Now available in softcover, bulk cases, ebook, and on Audible. Find out what the excitement is all about. Order your copies of Why We're Catholic at shop.catholic.com or at a good Catholic bookstore. Visit whywe'recatholic.com. If you're not a Bible scholar, the full message of how the Sunday Mass readings fit together can be tough to comprehend. Apologist Carlo Broussard is here to help. Join Carlo every Friday for the Sunday Catholic Word podcast. In each episode, he unpacks the scripture readings for that Sunday and brings them all together so you can better understand and defend the faith. Visit SundayCatholicWord.com to subscribe. That's SundayCatholicWord.com. What if the voice of your deepest doubts about Catholicism rose up in the form of a human being and challenged you to defend your most foundational beliefs? That's the task apologist Trent Horn took upon himself in his new book, Devil's Advocate, a dialogue with his own best objections against the faith that he professes and defends. You can stand up against your doubts, and Trent will show you how. Pick up your copy of Devil's Advocate today at shop.catholic.com or at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Our Lord needs articulate defenders of the truth to spread the joy of the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Monthly Giving Club, Society 315, helps you fulfill the call in 1 Peter 315 to always be prepared to make a defense for the hope that is in you. For as little as $10 a month, you'll help Catholics grow in faith, bring lapsed Catholics home, and lead non-Catholics to the truth. Go to casociety315.com and join today. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. There's a little groove music for you. Jimmy Aiken, our guest, open forum. Next hour, Mark Brumley, and lots of folks on the line. But a little bit of business to get to before we get there. We want to invite you to come on the Catholic Answers cruise, starting in Montreal on June 29th, ending in Boston on July 6th, and visiting Quebec and Nova Scotia. And lots of great talks on uh, the coming of uh, Christianity to the New World by some wonderful scholars. Chris Jack will be there. Uh, Joe Heschmeyer will be there. We'll do a flannel panel uh, on the sh- on the sh- boat ship. I guess you're supposed to say ship on the ship while we're there. You can find out all about it at CatholicAnswersCruise.com. But the main thing is, if you decide to come, use the promo code Pope Peter and get yourself $150 off on any tickets that you buy. Use the promo code Pope Peter at CatholicAnswersCruise.com. Now joining us in studio. Thomas, the TikTok engine, with a question from TikTok. Hello, Thomas. Good afternoon, Cy and Jimmy. I started to develop some uh, concerns about TikTok uh, with all the reporting yesterday in the news uh, uh, above senators yelling at uh, people who run social media companies. Oh, is it the once every three months again that we're doing that? Is that what we do that every three, every three yeah, months? Yeah, it feels like it. Uh, it uh, uh, well, I won't ask you political questions about it, but um, I'm glad that we're there on TikTok. Mm-hmm. And so you have a question for Jimmy? 
I do, yeah. Thanks for answering this one, Jimmy. Um, you know, as, as, as Catholics, we love our tradition, you know, right along with Scripture as uh, one of the sources of God's Word. Um, but in one, of our, uh, in one of our videos explaining this concept, someone asked us a rather important question, I think. They said, what do you measure oral traditions against to know whether it's from God or man-made? The Catholic Church understands that apostolic tradition, um, meaning tradition that has been passed down to us from the apostles, conveys the Word of God just like apostolic scripture does. And so they both are expressions of the Word of God. And if you want to figure out whether a tradition is part of the Word of God or conveys the Word of God, you apply tests that are similar to how do you know whether a scripture is genuinely the Word of God. One of the ways you do that is by comparing what the particular item you're looking at says, whether it's an item of Scripture or an item of tradition, with what you're already confident is part of the Word of God. So, for example, if you were trying to figure out, is Second Peter part of the Word of God, and you were already confident that the Gospel of Matthew is part of the Word of God, then you could compare what Second Peter says to what the Gospel of Matthew says. So you compare uncertain items against certain items. And the same thing happens with tradition. Thus, since we're confident that, you know, all of the Bible is part of the Word of God, then we can compare traditions to what the Bible says. We can also compare traditions that we have a question, is this genuinely apostolic, to what other traditions that we're confident are apostolic say. Um, in doing this, there is uncertainty for just us ordinary individuals, and this is something that the Church faced when it came to figuring out what is genuine Scripture versus what is it. There were various writings that were circulating in the early Church, like, for example, the Gospel of the Ebionites, or the secret book of John, the Apocryphon of John, that were not authentically apostolic, and so uh, what it ultimately took to figure out whether some of these books were genuinely apostolic and thus part of the Word of God versus which books were not, it took an act of the Church's teaching authority, because the Church is guided by the Holy Spirit, and so the Church's teaching authority was able to settle this question when it came to apostolic Scripture. The Church also has the same function when it comes to figuring out what is or is not apostolic tradition. So just like the Church helped the Church's teaching authority, guided by the Holy Spirit, helped us figure out which scriptures are apostolic and which are not. The Church's teaching authority also helps us figure out which traditions are apostolic and which are not. Great. Thanks so much, Jimmy. I'm really glad I don't have to do it all myself. Do what all yourself? Oh, no. oh, figure it all out. I yeah. see what you're yeah. saying. Yes. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm about to have a kid. I don't have time to compare traditions against traditions. You have to do it all yourself as far as posting this on TikTok, though. So yeah, I do. Get to yeah. it, Thomas. All right, I'm TikTok That's engine. easier. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> much easier. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, hi, Jimmy. Uh, all right, let's go to Donald in Plainsboro, New Jersey, listening on D uh, Domestic Church Media. Donald, uh, glad to have you here. Welcome. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Thank you, guys. Uh, Jimmy, the question I have is, uh, when and how did Jesus become aware of his own divinity? Well, so he, in his divine mind, he always knew about his divinity, because his divine mind is omniscient. Uh, the question is, when did his human intellect begin to contain that knowledge? When did he have a, an awareness in his human intellect of his divinity? And what the Magisterium teaches is that he was, in, in his human intellect, he was endowed with knowledge of everything that pertained to his mission, which would include knowledge of the fact that he's divine, because that pertains to his mission. Um, what the Magisterium does not, so far as I've been able to tell, have a teaching on is when that download occurred. You could propose that it occurred at the moment of conception. Or you could propose it occurred later, or maybe it occurred in stages. Um, but at, and what that means is, I think that I think that without violating church teaching, 
Catholic theologians could make different proposals on this subject. My own inclinations are to want to propose that this that this download occurred at the moment of conception, and then he displayed an awareness of these things as he as his as his neurology developed, you know, as a, as a zygote, he's a single cell, just like all of us were when we were zygotes. He doesn't have a brain at that point. And so you wouldn't be able to model the information, I am God, in, the, in a brain that doesn't yet exist. So I think it, it requires some time for this information that's resident in his human soul to manifest uh, in a way that expresses itself to where he can have the neurology to express the concept, I am God. And he also needs to learn the language enough. He needs to know enough Aramaic to be able to, um, to, to be able to say, I am God. And so in, but I suspect that as soon as his neurology was ready, and as soon as his knowledge of the language was there, he instantly, this is my preferred speculation, he instantly would have would have been able to realize this. And so, for example, in Aramaic, the word for God is Elah. And uh, my suspicion, this is this would be my speculation, is that as soon as he learned the meaning of Elah, so as soon as he learns the meaning of the word God, he's going to recognize that and say, that's what I am. Um, so in so this knowledge, even though I would I would propose that, you know, I, I this knowledge was likely given to him, downloaded into his soul at the mo- his human soul that came into being at the moment of conception. It then manifested as soon as he had um, sufficient neurological development and sufficient knowledge of the language in which the proposition is expressed. But there can be other 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 uh, other positions on this i can imagine someone saying you know god did a miracle in this case and he enabled christ's human intellect to have this knowledge even earlier than that maybe when maybe from the moment of conception if somehow god miraculously enabled the zygote jesus to to think in even though he didn't have a brain yet so i think there are different proposals that can be made on this question um but um, I've told you what my preferred solution would be, but I think there can be different ones without violating church teaching. One that I think is a hard limit on this is when Jesus was 12 years old, because when he was 12 years old, his parents left him behind accidentally in Jerusalem, and they found him in the temple. And when they found him, he said, well, didn't you know I would be in the house of my father? And that displays a consciousness of him having a unique relationship with God the Father. And so I would say that he's already manifesting knowledge of his divinity by the time he's 12 years old. We have, um, we have evidence, clear evidence of that in uh, the Gospel of Luke, and I would propose he had that awareness much earlier. But I think certainly by the time he was 12 years old, he had, he, we have a hard limit on, yes, he already had this awareness by that time, but I think it was probably much earlier. Donald, thank you. I hope that was helpful. Thank you for the question. It's Open Forum. Jimmy Aiken, our guest, right back after this. Hello, this is Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni of San Francisco. Keep your dial tuned to Catholic Answers Live. In Morse code, the sequence SOS is a distress call. It's been said that it stands for Save Our Souls. Well, right now our world is in big trouble, and we're putting out an SOS call for help. Will you answer that call? St. Paul Street Evangelization, a Catholic nonprofit, has hundreds of teams who share the good news with souls who don't know Jesus. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization. Visit streetevangelization.com to get involved. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. I don't like looking back. I prefer to look forward and keep moving forward. There's plenty to cover. I do a lot of research and try to dig out the bits and pieces of a life or of an agenda that people don't want to talk about. The World Over with Raymond Arroyo. Tonight, 8 Eastern on EWTN Radio and Television. Welcome back. 
Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken, our guest, he's the host, he's the maker of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. The Glomar Explorer got mentioned at the break. You, did you do an episode on the Glomar Explorer? I have not yet done the Glomar Explorer, but oh. since you've brought it up, the Glomar Explorer was a uh, part of a uh, secret government project where um, our intelligence services wanted to raise a Russian submarine, but to prevent them from knowing that it was U.S. intelligence that was going after their submarine, they hired Howard Hughes, <laughs> the a business tycoon, to have a ship called the Glomar Explorer that ostensibly had a purpose that had nothing to do with raising submarines but it was actually secretly built to raise this submarine and we got it but that led to the famous saying we can neither confirm nor deny uh, that was the glomar response when they were asked about this uh, to your knowledge has anyone made a movie of the glomar thing because i think that would just I, be the I great so oh, you think there I was think, a movie i think it's been oh. done there have certainly been documentaries about it uh theodore is next in new york watching on youtube uh, theodore uh, go ahead with your question for jimmy Hi, guys. Thanks for sparing some of your time. Uh, my question is just regarding uh, an ethics discussion I did in my class. Basically, mm -hmm. we listened to a podcast where um, a, a man whose father passed away, um, but he was a World War II soldier, and he didn't want to talk about his war stories because mm -hmm. that's obviously a touchy subject. But mm -hmm. his uncle ended up did telling him a few secrets, but he promised, made him promise not to tell anyone he told him because he didn't want to be embarrassed for spilling it. And then, yeah, he passed away, and then um, the, it just bothered the son because he wanted to know more and know the truth. And he he wanted to ask his mom, but he was afraid to, you know, give it away that his uncle told him. And people, like, who were either believers or not of um, Christ, basically, would have differing perspectives on whether it's right to spill a secret, because if you're a non-believer— you just think, well, we're not reunited with our deceased, so it's okay. Because yeah. Th Theodore, I'm not, not I'm not clear. I'm not clear on what your question is. Could you help me out? No, yeah, I would just. I'm sorry if I overexplained. Um, basically, mm -hmm. I was on the fence, and I'm just like, well, is do we carry these negative burdens with us when we pass on? Because I was just wondering, like, if mm -hmm. he were to tell his secret, would his uncle really be upset if he's in heaven? Basically. Okay, so let me see if I can. It, it's going to depend on what you mean by burden, um, but let me let me do my best with that, and you tell me if it if it gives you what you need. So we can carry burdens with us into the afterlife, and but we will not have them if we die in God's friendship after we're in heaven. So we're not going to be burdened once we're in heaven. We'll be able to enjoy heaven fully. And if we're confronted with things like, oh, you betrayed a secret I meant you to keep even after my death, well, if you're already in heaven, it certainly won't pain you at that point. You'll recognize that if someone betrayed a trust they should have kept, then um, you'll recognize it was bad what they did, but it's not going to cause you pain because we're not going to have pain in heaven. On the other hand, if you're still on your way to heaven, like if you're in purgatory being purified, well, then you might have some negative emotions. Um, but uh, they're going to be fundamentally in the context of, yay, I'm going to heaven, and yeah, you should have kept that secret, but, uh, but and you didn't, and that makes me a little mad, but yay, I'm going to heaven. So um, so ev any sufferings you had like that would be within a context of fundamental positivity. When it comes to the person who's broken the trust, um, when that person dies, well, uh, if, if, they are, if they shouldn't have broken it and they did anyway, then it, unless they've otherwise dealt with this, then, well, they'll need to be purified of that. They'll need to... They'll need to recognize, yeah, what I did was wrong, and they may feel bad about that temporarily, but that may be part of their purification, and then they'll end up going to heaven, and everything will be fine, and they won't have any more sadness or sorrow or anything like that once once they once their purification is complete and they're in heaven. Okay, Theodore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Let's go to Aaron in Pueblo, Colorado, listening on 1040 AM. Glad to have you here with us. Aaron, go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate you. Um, So uh, my basic question is, I was wondering if you could tell me, what manuscripts are used in the Catholic Bible for the Old Testament and the Deuterocanon today? Um, The Orthodox Study Bible I have, I know they they say they use the Septuagint, but we sort of have Mm -hmm. the Vulgate that stands between the Septuagint and our English translations today. So what's currently used for Catholic Bibles for the Old Testament? Okay, so um, are you asking about the Old Testament in general or specifically about the Deuterocanonicals? Um, interested in both, to, you know, what, okay. what documents, like, okay. do we use a Hebrew? So, so the, um, the standard Catholic Bible translations today are not translations of the Vulgate. Um, they're, they're translations from the original languages, or as close to the original languages as we can get. So, uh, for books of the Old Testament that were originally written in Hebrew, they use Hebrew manuscripts for passages that were originally written in Aramaic, like part of Daniel, for example, they will use um, the Aramaic. Uh, For parts that were written in Greek, like the deuterocanonical book Wisdom of Solomon, they will use the Greek. So they always try to use the original language, provided we have it available. If they don't uh, use the original language, like some of the deuterocanonicals appear to have been written in Hebrew or Aramaic, but we no longer have that, then we use uh, the Septuagint Greek. We also do something to cross-check, because no one manuscript tradition is perfect. And this is not a point of dispute among scholars. Catholic scholars acknowledge this. Protestant scholars acknowledge this. Um, What you frequently need to do is compare different manuscript traditions. Um, So, for example, even though the major Hebrew manuscript tradition is the Masoretic text, the Masoretic text is not always perfect. There are situations where we can tell, actually, the Septuagint Greek is closer to the original here, not in terms of the language, because it's a different language, but in terms of the meaning. Um, For example, in the in the Hebrew, the Masoretic version of Deuteronomy, I want to say it's Deuteronomy 32, where it talks about how God partitioned um, the the different races of mankind, the different nations, according to the number of, and it says the angels. And we can tell that, that or, or or another manuscript tradition will say according to the number of the sons of Israel. And neither of those really make sense. But we can tell in this case, the Septuagint preserves the meaning of the original better. What the original text said in Hebrew was according to the number of the sons of God. And so the sons of God are angelic beings, which explains why one version says according to the number of the angels, but it also has sons of in there, which is why another tradition has sons of Israel, because to that scribe, sons of God didn't make a lot of sense. But we can tell the original would have been according to the number of the sons of God. And so uh, we use not just one manuscript tradition, but we use all of the manuscript traditions we have to try to get as close to the original meaning as possible. And that includes all of the biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. It also can include the Latin, it can include Syriac, it can include other early manuscript traditions in other languages yet, because the goal is to try to get as close to the original meaning of the text as possible. Uh, The text will dominantly come from the earliest available version of the text we have, whether that's in Greek whether that's in Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek, but there is cross-correction by comparing different manuscript traditions in other languages, because there's no one manuscript tradition that's absolutely correct. And I'm going to leave it there, because I'm going to keep uh, moving and try to get as many on as I can with Jimmy uh, before we have to let him go. Uh, And Marie is in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, Marie, thank you for waiting. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Marie? Marie? Oh, Marie's coming. She'll get around to it. Should we? Uh... Okay, Marie. Let's... 
Hello. Hi, Marie. How are you? Very well. Go ahead <laughs> with your question for Jimmy. <laughs> well, I, I love your show because you answer everything that I ever wanted to hear, but now I can't remember um, how to approach my daughter. It, it sounds mm-hmm. easy over the phone when you talk about a marriage, second marriage, mm-hmm. not being uh, okay. annulled. And mm-hmm. here's the daughter in that situation. I've approached her saying it needs to be for you to be in right relationship with you know, God and be able to receive the sacraments. She said, I said, you just have to get it in the, uh, the annulment first. And then now that I've learned from you that she can get it not necessarily in the church, but by the bishop uh, and have the marriage uh, blessed. Mm-hmm. So I need to know if you have any materials I could just you know, here, you have this, and it'll give you some words to talk to your husband, who is really anti-God. He's not an atheist, he told me, but he's uh, he does not like to go into a Catholic church. I think he's got a thing against God because of the people in his life. Uh, so you, but you want something to give God. to your daughter to be able to help her. Yes. To, to, and to I, consider and how, a and for me, how can I even right? And how can I even give these words to her okay. where she will accept them? Okay, Jimmy. Okay, so um, I need to understand a little bit better your daughter's situation. Now, in terms of your husband's situation, um, I wrote a uh, a tract a number of years ago called "God's Love for You." And I also wrote a, a, a short book called The Words of Eternal Life. And if your husband is willing to read either a short tract or a short book, <clears throat> and it's a very small book, um, you, might, you might get him one of those. In fact, we may be able to send uh, Marie copies of those. Okay. When it comes to your daughter, I don't have anything that uh, is directly here's how to talk to your daughter about this situation um i i need to understand though what her position is vis-a-vis god right now is she living a life of faith does she believe in god is she interested in the catholic church or in another church i need to know where she is religiously right now in order to know how to approach her right um she is continuing to go to church Mm-hmm. Receiving at the sacraments, and that's what makes me okay. worried. Okay, so she's you, receiving. Marie, yeah. I just need to let you know we're about to hit the end of the show. So, I under, if I understand correctly, she's continuing to go to the Catholic Church, and she's continuing to receive the sacraments, even though she shouldn't. Correct? Right. That and that's okay. What's scary. Okay. So. Um, so this is something that is concerning, and I, you can only do so much in the circumstance, but you know, I would say, hey, I would be as loving as possible, but I'd say, I think it's great that you're going to, to Catholic Church. That's wonderful. You need to do that. You should do that. That's, that's great that you're doing that. And I, un- I understand you're receiving the sacraments, and that's great in principle, but there is this one thing you need to get cleared up in order to be able to do that, and that's your marital situation. So, um, you know, I, I know we had, you know, you had a divorce, and now you have a civil remarriage, and you know, you do want to, you do want to make sure that 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 you're right with God, because in the Gospels, Jesus was very strict on the subject of divorce. He said, if you divorce and remarry. That's adultery, and adultery is, you know, that that's one of the Ten Commandments. So you really don't want to, um, you really don't want to be committing adultery. That's something that is gonna gonna harm your your relationship with God. So in order to in order to establish that you're not in this kind of situation, the church needs to look at your first marriage and see, well, was it really a marriage at all? Because it may not have been. There may have been some problem, not necessarily through anybody's fault, but there may have been some problem with it that kept it from being a real marriage, and then you will would be free to have your marriage blessed with your current husband. So the church really needs to look at this, and I'm, I'm telling you this because I love you, and I want everything to go great between you and God. There also are books about annulments that you might want to share with her. I would recommend ones written by canonist Edward Peter. 
Speakers. If you go on Amazon or shop.catholic.com and type in annulment, you should be able to get something good by either Ed Peters or by me, because I did a booklet on this a a number of years ago. Uh, Marie, we'll send you those two books, God's Love for You and Words of Eternal Life. If you just hang on and give us an address, we will send it. Jimmy, thank you for the hour. Uh, We'll see you again tomorrow. Okay, see you then. All right, we'll be right back with more Open Forum with Mark Brumley right after this on Catholic Answers Live. Mm 